Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and today's show is going to be featuring Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer and explorer who appears regularly on TV as a legal analyst, psychic medium, and expert on the paranormal, after-death communication, and near-death experiences. This show, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Welt Magazine listed Dare to Dream as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It's a high-ranking self-improvement podcast on Apple Podcasts and nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and for a Webby Award. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out in the world. If you would like to become a facilitator or take a class, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com and sign up today. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a media visibility specialist. I do several things under media visibility out into the world. I am a book writing coach and I run a Zoom group twice a month for authors who come in with the idea of the book and complete it to publish. I also take your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status. It's such an exciting process. And finally, I show folks how to be interviewed on radio and podcast, the entire system, and how to get massive results. And I know what I'm doing because I run a boutique publicity service. I take on just a handful of great clients. And I also myself have been interviewed on over 2,000 media outlets. So if you'd like to learn how, you can join and start free. I've got a gift for you. So it's got templates and videos and all the how-tos. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. My guest, Mark Anthony J.D., the psychic explorer, also known as the psychic lawyer, is a fourth-generation psychic medium who communicates with spirits. He is an Oxford-educated attorney licensed to practice law in Florida, Washington, D.C., and before the United States Supreme Court. He recently won the OMI Award for Best Psychic Medium. Mark appears nationwide on TV and radio as a psychic medium, legal analyst, NDE researcher, and expert in the paranormal and ancient mysteries. Mark co-hosts The Psychic and the Doc on Transformation Network. He's a VIP executive contributor for Best Holistic Life magazine, and he is the author of award-winning bestsellers, The Afterlife Frequency, Evidence of Eternity, and Never Letting Go. If you would like to learn more about him, go to afterlifefrequency.com to learn more about Mark. And with that, I welcome Mark Anthony to the Dare to Dream show. It is so great to have you. Thank you, Debbie. It's really great to be here. I've I've been so looking forward to doing this show with you. Thank you so much. Me too, because I feel like I know you. I've watched your very many appearances on TV. Wow. First of all, you have a great personality. You're built for it. But second of all, that you can pull it out like that with audience members. And I mean, you're, you're really gifted, really gifted. So I want to talk at the top about reincarnation, about grief, about dying, because that's one of the subjects you're really good at and an expert at. I'm mostly curious, what do people not know about those subjects that you wish they knew that you could help them with? Can you share any info that creates healing around that? That's a pretty complex question that could take days to answer. Um, (laughs) But uh, why don't we start with reincarnation um, Mm -hmm. and and say the question is, what do I wish people knew more about reincarnation? There are several things, but reincarnation has traditionally been seen as a Hindu or Buddhist belief. You know, because that you know, you always hear about Hindus and Buddhists have have no qualms about talking about reincarnation. But what most people don't understand is that reincarnation is actually central to all of the great belief systems. So if I could change anyone's thinking on that, that that's where I'd begin with. If you go to the mystical Hasidic sect of Judaism, 
there's a passage in the book of Job that says, naked I left my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. And a lot of theologians believe that this is a reference to reincarnation, as is Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's Ladder is one of the most mysterious and studied passages in Scripture, and it's not just um, Hebrew, Jewish, and, and Christian scholars, but uh, progressive Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, Jains have looked very closely at, at Jacob's Ladder, and, and basically, Jacob is, is on, a, on a journey, and he stops and sleeps for the night, and he has this dream where he sees this immense ladder with angels going to and fro. It's like this, this huge circular um, tra travel pattern of angels going to and from heaven. And there are so many interpretations of this. But the, like I said, the um, progressive uh, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, and Buddhist scholars look at that as the cycle of life, which in Hinduism and Buddhism is the doctrine of samsara the eternal cycle of life. And so that the angels going to heaven and returning, going to and fro heaven is symbolic of reincarnation, that we leave the material world, we go to heaven, and then we return. And, and then there is a uh, the passage in three different of the Gospels, um, Matthew, Luke, and I believe Mark, the transfiguration. Now, this is another one where... Um, the, the reincarnation scholars, uh, no matter what faith, really zero in on. And it, it's so funny because I always hear people saying mediums are not of God. And it's like, yeah, but you need to read the entire passage because if you do in the book of Deuteronomy, if you go to, uh, I think it's Deuteronomy 18, verse 22, it says, if what the prophet, and that's um, Old Testament speak for, for a, a psychic, if what the prophet says is true or comes true, then it is the word of God. You know, but people go to like one of the first, second lines, mediums are not a God. And it's like, look, you can't take a salad bar approach and pick and choose what you want. You have to examine the entire document. But let's fast forward to the New Testament to the transfiguration. So what happens there is Jesus takes a select group of apostles to the top of a mountain and then he begins to glow white, and, and mist appears around them, and the spirits of the prophet Elijah and the prophet Moses form on either side of him. Now, we could spend the entire show just discussing this, but I'm giving us the shortened version. Well, understandably, the disciples are freaked out. I mean, this is pretty intense, and there's Jesus with, you know, you know two of the superstars from the Old Testament, and so afterwards, uh, he's having a discussion with them, and it comes up, well, who do you say that I am? And the, some of the apostles say, well, some say that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you are the prophet Elijah returned. And Jesus says to them that Elijah has returned, but they did not recognize him. And, and it says that they realized he was speaking of John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Here's what was going on. John the Baptist was Jesus's first cousin, mm -hmm. it states that in scripture, and he was beheaded by um, order of Herod Antipas, um, you know, who was the son of Herod the Great, who's the one that, you know, was trying to kill all the infants because, you know, didn't want Jesus to be the, the king of Judea. But Elijah lived 800 years before Jesus and his cousin John the Baptist. So if Elijah did return and appeared in the form of John the Baptist, the reincarnation scholars, one of which I am, argue that this is a reference to reincarnation that wasn't edited out at the various ecumenical councils. So when we start to examine reincarnation, it doesn't really run contrary to beliefs about eternal life in salvation, it just gives a different interpretation. So that is the the shortest answer I could give on if if um, if I could get people to believe something that they don't know about reincarnation. That's the one that that I would. That's huge, amazing, amazing. The references you had. I was thinking while you were sharing about uh, Jacob's ladder. Um, 
I was born Jewish. I don't remember seeing that, although I'm just very spiritual, not religious. And I remember seeing a movie when I was young that was starring Tim Robbins. And I believe that yeah. was the title was Jacob's it Ladder. It was a scary movie. Yeah, it was so a real scary, scary movie. Yes, I was terrified watching it. And so I still have that reference point of like, oh. Yeah, <laughs> that's what people do. It's in the book of Genesis. And uh, the passage, uh, which is referred to as Jacob's Ladder, is not scary. But I remember the movie and I, you know, I'm not a big fan of horror movies and I tried to watch it and I, I get bored with them. Plus, I mean, to me, there are people who love horror movies. I've had friends that they just thrive on that stuff. I don't care to see them. Um, look, I was a prosecutor. I was a criminal defense attorney. I've worked in law enforcement. Um, I don't need a boogeyman. The The horror story is happening in our world right now. Mm -hmm. And an eye for an eye, Gandhi was right when he said an eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind. You know, humans are really good at killing other humans and inflicting misery. And and so I don't need to go to a, a movie uh, to see some, you know, fantasy boogeyman doing things that are happening in our midst. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Well, I can't stand the vibration and how I feel afterwards. Yeah. So it's not my scene at all. I also love what you shared about John the Baptist and about Jesus and the reincarnation from Elijah. I I. I follow sometimes that history. I just recently, I, the last couple of years, I find it very, very interesting. And so, you know, incredible what you're sharing that you're even a scholar in that. And, and let me ask you then um, from my too big question in the beginning, what about grieving? Because everybody here, everybody, we're all going to lose an animal, a family member, a loved one, it's going to happen and probably multiple times. I think we're very ill-equipped. We're very ill-equipped to help people, right? As a friend, to know what to say, to know how to show up. And as someone going through the grieving, we're ve very ill-equipped to be able to say, here's what I need, or if we even can articulate in the midst of all of that experience, what can you shed light on that we don't know about, about that whole process? Grieving is part of the human condition. And, and I like the way you said, no matter what, you're going to go through it at some point in your life. And I encounter a lot of people, usually younger people in their teens and 20s, you know, and they find out that I'm a medium and they said, well, I don't know how that would help me. And I said, well, have you lost anyone that you love who's died? I mean, have, has, have you lost a loved one? Well, no. And I always tell them, enjoy that status while it lasts, because there's going to come a day when that changes and you're never going to be the same. Your world is never going to be the same. I think what people need to understand about grief is that it is a path no one wants to take, but it is a road that we are all shoved down at some point in life. And there is nothing we can do about the fact a loved one has died. Yeah. But what we can do is change how we react to the death. In my work as an attorney and as a medium, I've seen the destructive force of, of, of grief. And what I want everyone to know is the grief crime grief cycle, which I introduced in my second book, Evidence of Eternity. And what I found is, and I, I started noticing this during the practice of law. I've never met a happy drug addict or a happy alcoholic. Okay, people who, who self-medicate. It's not because you wake up one day and go, you know, my life is really good. I think I'll start shooting heroin. All right, that's not what happens. People are hurting. They're in physical and emotional pain. And what I started seeing, let's take um, an alcoholic who gets behind the wheel of a car and then kills somebody in a drunk driving accident. That person, I would say 99.99999% of the time, never meant to hurt anybody, but they did. So in the criminal justice system, is very punitive and they start you know, punishing them. And, and I do understand why they do that. But let's look at this. What I have found in the vast majority of cases with alcoholics and drug addicts is that somewhere in that person's life, generally in childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, there's an unresolved grief. 
um, death of a parent, a sibling, maybe even a beloved pet, um, a grandparent. I mean, somebody that meant a lot to them. And not all families, Debbie, are are, are like uh, the one you probably grew up in and I did, where your family or your parents would talk to you about things. I mean, you get a lot of people that, oh, don't think about it. Oh, he's just a little kid. It won't bother him. Well, it does bother children. And, and you have to be very careful when dealing with children in grief, find out what they know, what they're feeling. You can't deny, you can't avoid, you can't out, um, you can't out smoke your grief, out snort it, out drink it, out sex it, out steal things. You can't engage in these temporary feel good highs to dispel of grief. And so if you suppress the grief, that then leads to behaviors which can cause you to um, engage in criminal activity, which then can inflict grief upon another person, hence grief, crime, grief. So it's very important to accept the reality of the death through counseling, through family support, turn to your faith community, learn about it, confront it, accept it, and instead of turning to the drugs and alcohol, turn to your spirituality, turn to doing acts of charity and kindness, turn to learning about death and grieving. And in so doing, you can avoid that horror of the grief, crime, grief cycle. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. I just read today in People magazine about a woman who is part of um, Senate. And she was telling a really fascinating story about a home invasion that occurred where her mother and father were living in Beverly Hills and just a terrible crime because whoever did it ran away with nothing and shot her mother in the back. She got the awful call from her husband. Mom's been shot, come to the hospital. Her mother didn't make it. And the first thing this woman thought in this disbelief, this rage, the shock that came up for her was, dear God, please don't let this take me down. Please do not let me hate this person. Let me learn how to forgive, which I think, wow, what an yeah. angelic moment this human being had that yeah. they would know in that moment, this is going to poison me for the rest of my life. And she made that choice and asked for help. And I believe she got it because she did go not only and everything you're speaking to right now, Mark, not only did she go into the proaction of, of course, caring for her mother, of course, caring for her own real grief and feelings, but then forgiving this individual. And then she took it even further and did things in her mother's honor as charity, buying bicycles for kids in Watts, you know, and all sorts of beautiful acts of kindness. So what you're saying, I really hear is to stop perpetuating the cycle, right? Yes. Grief, yes. crime, grief, just stop it with you. And it's not easy, but you can find ways to ameliorate your feelings in a really natural, organic way. You don't have to use and abuse. And we all go through it. There are places that can help you. Yes. And, and grief is very complex. And I'd like to uh, talk to the male viewers, listeners for a moment. As guys, we are socialized not to display our emotions in public, certainly not to cry. And a lot of times people mistake a man's not wanting to talk about the death of a loved one um, with being callous or cold. You have to realize men and women, yes, we're equal, but what we're different because men tend to internalize their feelings more. And I think women are better at, at, at grief because they will acknowledge the pain. They will acknowledge this. And crying, crying is therapeutic. Now, guys, that doesn't mean go out in public and start crying or walk into the office and start crying, but go somewhere, maybe drive somewhere and park. And here's why I'm saying this. It has been scientifically proven at, um, I believe, University of Minnesota and also, I think, USC and, and other institutions that tears of grief, which are different than reflex tears. Reflex tears are, you know, something makes you sneeze and, you know, you're allergic and, and tears are coming out. But tears caused by grief actually contain the neurotransmitters that cause depression. 
So when you cry, you're getting the chemicals in your body that cause grief out of your body. That's why when you have a really intense grief cry, afterwards you feel exhausted, but also it's like you're shaking up a, a, a soda and then you pop the top and phew, you're letting out all that extra pressure because you actually are. So crying is, is a good thing. It isn't weak. It isn't unmanly. Guys, we have tear ducts. We have feelings and we have hearts for a reason. And my dad, a U.S. Navy SEAL, told me a real man is never afraid to cry for someone he loved who died. Oh, that's so beautiful. What a great father to teach you that. I love that. He put a good man out in the world. And it's really true. And especially, I think, the years you and I grew up, that's especially true. I find the younger guys, they're much more connected to their sensitivity and their feelings, much easier about expressing that. And, you know, yeah, it's healing. To cry is healing. They are. You know, and I'll say this about the millennial dads are really great dads. They're, they're right on in there. I see millennial dads um, changing the babies, loving them up, feeding them. You know, we're in generations before it's that was woman's work, all right, which is, you know, first off, that's incredibly chauvinistic. But secondly, by loving your child and showing that baby, that toddler, that love and affection, you're bonding with the child. And it's really going to come in handy when they turn into teenagers. You know? so, um, so I I really am impressed at there is a shift where um, younger men, it's it's no longer a social taboo to suppress their emotions. Yeah, I agree. I get to hang out with a lot of people who are younger and I'm really thrilled. I feel I sometimes feel like I was born in the right, wrong time. Like I'm, I'm so that, you know, I love everything they believe in and how they connect and how they show up and how they care about the earth and all of that. It's so important. And so speaking about being younger, I want to ask you about you. In your book, Afterlife Frequency, you reveal how it was for you growing up as a psychic, your fourth generation, which is amazing. You come embedded with all these skills besides your own. Your mom was a psychic named Jeannie. And yes. so how, talk about you waking up and realizing you have this ability. Both my parents had these abilities and uh, the two sides of the family could not possibly have been more different. My dad hailed from Pennsylvania and his family, they're very conservative Pennsylvanian Baptist. And his, I think it was his grandfather um, founded a Baptist church. And, but my father had four siblings, three sisters and a brother, and one of his sisters had mediumistic ability like he did, as did their mother, Isabel, and their maternal grandmother, Grace. Mm -hmm. And, but um, they kept it very hush-hush. This was something that simply wasn't discussed in public. And then my mother's side of the family came over from Italy. And my mother and her maternal great-grandmother, Giovanna, um, were mediums. And there's other people in the family as well. But Giovanna was like the medium on steroids. And um, she was respected in the Italian Catholic community of North Jersey and New York City. Um, I always like the joke is like, you know, Tony St Soprano's stomping grounds. But, but that's where, you know, a lot of Italians uh, lived in that area. And officials from the Catholic Church, I mean, we're talking from nuns all the way up to even a car cardinals, would meet with Giovanna and talk to her about faith and about the afterlife. And in fact, PBS did a special in 2016 called The Italian Americans. It was about, it was like a, a two night special. They did an entire segment on Giovanna and referenced her psychic abilities. I know. I remember seeing. I you know I knew it was coming up, and and all uh, my cousins and I we were all on the phone, you know, texting and talking to each other. Did you see that? So so here I am, um, my or or here my my parents are. Dad gets out of the navy, so he's this 
young buck Navy SEAL, and he goes to a dance, you know, a USO dance, and he says, I see this foxy looking dame. He's talking about my mom. He thought she was like 30. She was only 19, but she worked at a high-end retailer and she got all the latest fashions wholesale. Okay, so mom was always, you know, decked to the nines and she always did right up to the day she passed. Mom always looked fantastic. And they, you know, they start dancing. Both my parents were ballroom dancers. That is not a trait I have inherited. Um, and after a couple of dates, they felt very connected. And it was more than just, you know, young people sexually or physically attracted to each other. And mom was a good Catholic girl. So it's like nothing was going to happen. All right. But she said to him, she said, my dad's name is Earl. She said, Earl, before we go any, any further with this, I got to tell you something. I see spirits. Mm. And my dad replied, as only a sailor could, a series of colorful metaphors followed by, I do too. <laughs> and so they realized that their connection was more than just attraction. It was this, this physical thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I have two older siblings, and my parents had not planned to have any more children. So I was a bit older, or they were a bit older when I came along. And at three and a half years old, I start talking to my invisible friends. And I remember mom and dad looking at me because they could see them too. And mom going, oh, he's got it. And dad going, colorful metaphor, oh, he's got it. <laughs> so so the reactions were, were quite different. Um, my dad was, if you'll indulge me for a moment, the reason my dad was so concerned because when I was about five, I was five years old when I started first grade and I went to Catholic school. And so before I went to school, my first day, dad said, don't talk about this to anyone but your mother and me, because people who talk about seeing things that others don't get taken away. And, and it scared me and he could see I was scared. And, and he explained to me, he goes, Mark, he goes, they won't understand. And of course, when I got into school, I, you know, I thought, oh, they're talking about angels and saints and all these invisible beings. And, and I thought, yeah, this will be cool. And then I realized pretty quickly, yeah, it was okay if, if you saw, um, you know, people 2000 years ago can, can see spirits, but nobody can now, you know, Holy Mother Church and all that stuff. The reason my dad was so concerned, his sister Marjorie, and I never met Marjorie, at least not in this world. Um, she was married to a religious zealot. Uh, fanatic would be a better term. And he didn't like her abilities. He was a machinist. He worked at the steel plant in Pennsylvania. And so, Debbie, one day he was getting ready to go to work, and Marjorie begged him not to go. She had a terrible feeling in the pit of her stomach. She threw a fit. They got into a huge argument. Fine, I'll stay home. Well, that day at the steel plant, this crane was lifting a couple thousand pounds of steel beams, and then the cable snapped. And it crushed the machine shop that he worked in and killed everybody in it. Wow. If he had been there, I'd say there was pretty much an almost 100% chance he would have been killed. One might think he would have been grateful. But instead, this compounded his fear of his wife's ability that she was somehow doing the work of, of Satan and he conspired with a psychiatrist who diagnosed her as paranoid schizophrenic. And they literally sent an ambulance to their house. Men in white coats forcibly removed her from her home, put her in a straitjacket, took her to a mental institution and subjected her to electroshock therapy over a period of six months. And my dad said when Marjorie... He said, Mar he called her Marge. She said, when Marge got out of there, he said, she, that sparkle wasn't in her eye anymore. And she never again ever talked about seeing spirits or seeing future events. And so I didn't know that until I was, I was in my late teens when I found out what really happened. And then I realized why my dad the Navy SEAL was being protective of me. That's why he told me when I was a little boy, people who see things others don't get taken away. Mm. 
And, and I'm very thankful, Debbie, that times have changed. I mean, here I am on your show. I've been on, on uh, national television a number of times, uh, regional television, radio shows. I mean, I got my own show where not only do I talk about this, but I actually do it for, for callers. And we've gone out of from the fringe into the mainstream, but the price people have paid, people like me have paid over the centuries and who are still being executed in Middle Eastern countries for having these abilities. Um, we have to put up with the taunts, the jeers, uh, the nasty. Uh, social media gives cowards a chance to be bullies because they, you know, they would never say these things to your face. And I'm not whining and complaining, but what I'm telling, um, what I'm I'm sharing is that yes, it's it's a gift from God that I thank God for every single day. But with every gift, it comes with a price. Not everybody's going to believe it. There are people out there always trying to debunk it and to attack us. But you know what? None of them matter. What matters is when myself and, and legitimate mediums like myself are able to make a connection for somebody who is just mired in pain and grief and the connection with their loved one or loved ones in spirit helps alleviate alleviate some of that pain, that is what matters. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And I'm curious, I assume Marjorie is now on the other side. She's I never. Yes, she has. I never met her. And, and the, the amazing thing, Debbie, is she comes to me. I remember- That was going to be my question. I had yeah, a feeling, like, uh, well, you're the in, one who in, came out of the closet. You're the one finally doing it at a time when you can. And I thought Marjorie must be there rooting for you. Oh, and she tends to show up whenever something bad's about to happen. She warns me. And in my latest book, The Afterlife Frequency, Marjorie appears in my book, Evidence of Eternity, and then in The Afterlife Frequency. And I'm not going to tell anybody about, about those stories because- because you know, I want I, you know, I, I think you should read them. But um, I, I remember I was um, with my dad one time, and I said, "There's a spirit around you." And she reminds me of that actress, Catherine Hepburn, thin, wearing like a white blouse, you know, white button-down blouse, and a dark skirt going below her knees, and real smart. And I was describing her, and he goes, "Oh my God, it's Marge." Yeah, because she used to ride horses and she uh, used to read books all the time. And she, she, uh, he said, yeah, she was a lot like uh, that actress, Catherine Hepburn, you know, that, that uh, prim proper, but very athletic and, and outgoing. And, um, and she's, she, her spirit is ecstatic that, like you said, I'm able to, to discuss these things that she was, she was vilified. She was tortured because because these beautiful gifts that she had. Have you ever asked her, because I'm curious, why, why her soul chose that path? Why her soul cho chose to take that on, to be given a gift, not be able to use it and vilified for it, tortured for it. Was there something her soul needed to learn in that lifetime to experience that? I, I'm not um, received an answer, or I've, I've not posed that particular question to her, but let's take that question to a broader scope. What about people that are born with horrific disabilities, or people that, like uh, military personnel, that lose limbs, or people that suffer severe brain damage, or somebody in the prime of life that gets struck down by cancer? Why? What about parents who lose a child? How do you possibly, how can we possibly make sense out of the most crushing pain imaginable, losing, losing a child? And in the thousands of readings that I've done, it's about 15,000 readings, people ask why. And we tend to look at our life in the material world sense. We're born, we come into this world, we, we grow older to a certain point, and then we die. And we tend to think that that's our entire existence. And spirits explain to me that is just part. That's just a ripple in the ocean that is our eternal life as an electromagnetic soul, as an electromagnetic entity. And 
we come into this world to experience things that we simply can't when we're pure energy. Um, in the afterlife frequency, I introduced the term the electromagnetic soul to describe what we really are, which is pure consciousness, aka a soul, a spirit, that is eternal electromagnetic energy. And we know from physics, energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. You look at all the great belief systems, they all talk about the soul pre-existing the body coming in and moving on after the body. Well, when you're pure energy, which doesn't get old, sick, tired, or die, and you're interconnected with other spirits, interconnected with others into what I call the collective consciousness, that is from what, what they all tell me is pretty damn cool, <laughs> okay? It's, it's awesome. And they're able to acquire knowledge and, and experiences that we can't even comprehend uh, of. But they, they, meaning we, come into this life to experience things we can't in on the other side. And it appears that what we experience in this world has some type of relation to the frequency we're going into on the other side. So if you go through a horrific and painful life, that means you have accomplished and experienced things that, in other words, you're balancing out your karma. And this ties into, into the, the reincarnation aspect, because especially with um, what's known as court, case of the reincarnation type, children who, young children who start recalling memories of a past lifetime, and let's say they're, they're terrified of drowning, because in the prior life they drown, and then they have to go through by acknowledging that they are no longer afraid of it in this life and, and so on and so forth. So it appears that we have to come into this world, go through some really horrible things. And then when we leave, we go to a different frequency. There's no hell, um, but there is frequencies, just like there's frequencies on a, on a radio, uh, radio FM, AM band, and so that is because I've asked them and they, that, that's how they explain it. They said, you really can't understand the enormity of it, but that's what you can understand. Yeah. I want to thank you. That's an amazing explanation. I want to give a quote from you, Mark, which, and it may be directly from your book. It's the energy of an electromagnetic soul in the other side dimension vibrates at a much higher frequency than the energetic vibration of humans living in the material world because the electromagnetic soul moves at the speed of light, travels between dimensions for spirit. It's easy. It's as easy as stepping from one room to another. So very powerful because I think it's beneficial to know that if somebody you know, was dealt maybe not the best set of cards they believe they could have gotten, that it's not perpetual, that they're not going to have to, oh, it's going to be like this lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, like mm. somehow that's my soul's path to understand right. that something is occurring. And if you will, maybe a check mark, we don't have to do that again, been there, done that, and we can move on to different experiences. Correct. And, and I want to make sure that all the, the listeners understand this. When Debbie and I talk about um, how wonderful it is to be a spirit and how wonderful the other side is, we are not in any shape, form, or fashion encouraging anyone to cut your life short. Because I know there's a lot of people out there that are grappling with depression. You know, maybe it's, you know, you're, you're in the wake of losing a child or your life partner or, you know, you just are depressed and some people have medical conditions that lead to a depression. It is not your place to cut your life short because suicide has all types of karmic ramifications. You know, there is no hell, but there is reincarnation. So if you think your life is lousy this time, oh, it could be even worse next time. Wow. And, and if you look at all the religions, like Christianity says, you go to hell, you know, and the, you know, uh, hardcore Christians, I mean, they love flinging everybody in hell. So do Muslims, Muslims and Christians love hell and everyone's going to it except them, you know, and um, but but even the the normally tolerant Buddhists and the Hindus say that um, suicide will lead to a very, very negative next incarnation. So when you reincarnate and so so the point here 
is play the cards that you're dealt with. Hmm. Okay, that you're dealt. Get through this. The Hindus talk about karma like being knots that you tie in a string. And so you want to leave this world with as few knots as possible. Mm. If you can untie those knots, uh, untie them. Um, yeah, you know, I, I was at a funeral for a friend about, uh, I guess it was about two years ago. Um, and she was just an awesome, awesome person. And there were people there that I knew in junior high and high school. And I remember one guy said, oh, we got into a fight and you gave me a black eye. You know, and I apologized. I said, I'm really sorry. And he goes, you are? And I said, yeah. And and I felt really bad that after all these years, that was what he remembered. And and he was so appreciative. And I'm not saying that, to, you know, to give myself brownie points, but he was there and I was there yes, for our friend, but maybe also for other reasons as well. And maybe that was our chance to untie that knot. I love yeah. that story. Thank you so much. It is never too late to apologize. It is never too late to be responsible and say mea culpa. And I had something similar happen. It's a long time ago now, probably 12 years ago on Facebook, I posted something and somebody I had apparently grown up with wrote something very disparaging about me. And it was clear I had done something to this person as a kid. And what was horrible is I don't even remember them, but they yeah. have carried this for decades and decades and decades like poison. And yes, you know, I, who knows? Who knows what went on? If I was provoked, not provoked, if I was just a stupid little kid and did something really dumb to somebody else and went on with my life, I don't know. But I know that feeling you're saying where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, whatever I could do to, you know, recompense because I don't want you to live like that anymore or feel like this anymore. And truly, it's not who I am today. So I think you know, amends are huge. It's this, these knots you're talking about. I think that's the greatest way. There have been times in my life, uncomfortable, but talk about doing inventory, you know, taking a look at all the things throughout life you don't want to look at that you've done and been and one by one showing up to situations and people and saying, I did it. I'm sorry. And here's yeah. how I'm going to make up for it. Yeah. It's not right. It's not good. And I, when we do that, we're carrying like suitcases of stuff we don't want to look at. And the freedom when we speak it out loud and take responsibility, it's scary. I, I mean, there were times I was really scared to do what I did, but wow, it well, was powerful. And that it's so good that you're sharing that because we're all a work in progress. Yeah. Um, you know, when like you and me, we put ourselves out there, we're spiritual teachers and, and, you know, people expect us to be saint-like and perfect, you know, and I'm not, you know, and, and, uh, you know, look, I was a lawyer, I, you know, I grew up in an Italian household and, and, you know, <laughs> I've got some snarky comebacks for people and, and, you know, and, and that type of thing. And I, but, you know, in the bigger sense, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but also people need to realize too, that um, to respect boundaries, like, I, you know, I, I like I have been at events and then people will send me something. I tried to talk to you and you wouldn't talk to me. Well, I'm at an event and there's a thousand people that want to talk to me. And I may have said, hold on a minute. Or uh, I remember one one lady would, wouldn't stop. She's like, gig, 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 like on me, like asking those questions. I go, look, I'm not answering any questions right now. I haven't eaten all day and I just want to have a piece of pizza. She went <laughs> and it's like, you know, you got to realize that you should never put anybody on a pedestal. Okay. Debbie and I, we are sharing our experiences. Does this make us a saint? No. Does this give us, do we have all the answers? No. I have insights based on my abilities and based on my life experiences and the things that, that I've studied. But you also have to realize that we're all human beings. We all have foibles. We all have shortcomings. Okay. And for the most part, we try to do our best. 
So especially in very public, because I speak also on stage in very public situations like that. Yes, it can be a lot. It really can be a lot. And I've had similar things happen um, to just like respect the space a little bit. I will, yeah. I will I, <laughs> respect the space and the pizza for a minute. <laughs> we got to have lunch. You yeah, got to move on with their life. It, yeah, it's amazing. You know, people expect, I remember I came out of, uh, I was at the dentist and I had a root canal. You know, <laughs> root canals are not pleasant. And I'm, and I'm at the counter and I'm, you know, given the, the, you know, the girl that worked there, my, you know, my, my payment and all that. She goes, is there anybody around me? Can you see any spirits? <laughs> and I, go, I know I go, sweetheart. I just had a hole drilled in my head. I ain't seeing nothing. All I want to do is get that prescription for these happy pills, take a few of them and go home and, and lay down. You know, my big accomplishment today may be watching Netflix, you know. So so people, you know, it, it's funny because um somebody sent me um um a message recently. I was at some restaurant. She goes, Were you reading me? She was the receptionist. Um, no, I was there to have breakfast, not to read the receptionist. I mean, it, it's it's bizarre what people think, you know, or expect of a medium. They think that, you know, we're tuned in all the time. It, with mediumship, I'm either um, turned on or turned off. Yes. And you have to, you meaning the medium, has to establish the parameters of the contact because you don't leave the doors and windows of your house open 24 seven. So obviously I don't want to leave um, my, my um, psyche open 24 seven, because that also diminishes the quality of the contact. So there'll be a time when, you know, I'm doing this or I'm not doing this, but for somebody that showed me to a table to think that I was, you know, going around doing my Vulcan mind meld on her and I'm and being funny there, but uh, no, I was just there to have eggs and toast with a couple of friends. Yeah, so. Yes, a hundred percent. And and just so folks like understand, have a heightened sensitivity about what Mark is saying. Imagine if you lived in California, imagine you went to the Hollywood Bowl. That's like, or a football stadium. And imagine you were a medium and you were turned on. Oh, like I can't, right? That's just even overwhelming. Oh. Couldn't, you couldn't function. So this is what it's like to have these gifts. You have to have this thermometer, this setting, so you know when to open up to this. So I want to ask you about that, what it's like to be you a little bit, because um, I'll preface it by saying I had a conversation once with the divine about seeing dead people, because the divine yeah. was showing up and expressing to me very clearly a couple of adjectives to describe me, and I I didn't. I wouldn't say it arguing, but I definitely debated. And I said, I'm not those things. They were very grand things. And I I felt like that's you, that's Mark, or those are my friends who are gifted. Like, what are you saying? And they was trying to express something, but they were relentless and beautiful and gentle. And so the first time they showed up to discuss this with me, I, the first thing I said to them was, well, I'm not going to see dead people. And they were so loving. You know, they were just like, okay. And then the next night they showed up again with the same information. And then they were so smart. They showed me what it was like to see dead people. And I went, oh, okay. That's not all that horror I had built up in my head. So that story goes on. But I want to come back to you and ask you, what is it like for you? Is it ever scary? Is it ever, does it ever feel out of control or is it just always this fascinating getting to know somebody and helping somebody? In the thousands of readings that I've done, I've never been scared. Ah. And, uh, you know, and I've been on a number of paranormal investigations. Um, I'm going to be in an upcoming series. I'm not at liberty to say the name, but it will be on Discovery Channel. I know and, until <laughs> until it, it, it it's announced um, where we're investigating this abandoned insane asylum and of course we are filming it at, at 11 30 it took to like 1 a.m you know in, in the middle of the night and it, and it was fascinating because um i was in the chapel of the place and there was paintings of jesus on the wall behind me and they were all cracked and the ceiling was falling in and so they were starting my initial invest you know interview there and there was a bat flying around behind me uh, which I didn't see. Okay, so they're filming this because the, I guess the bat was attracted, you know, plus we're in this creepy building. It's 100 plus years old. 
And my manager, Rocky, she was with the cameraman. She goes, is that some special effect thing, you guys? And the guy was from New York. He's like, no, that's a bat. You know, and I remember when they cut the scene, the director goes, oh, that's great. We got the bat in there, you know, so. But but then we started doing the actual investigation and, and uh, they were like, well, is there demons here and all that? And that's not what I was sensing. And and what I was picking up on was a lot of residual energy echoes of some of the terrible things that have happened there. Mm. A residual energy echo, matter retains vibration. Mm-hmm. So if there's a site where something horrible has happened, like I've been to Dachau concentration camp outside of Munich in Germany, talk about residual energy echoes. Mm-hmm. I've been to ground zero. I've been to murder murder uh, scenes and investigations. And so you pick up on on uh, what has happened there. So when many times you got to be careful that if you're sensing what some people may see or perceive as a spirit, it's actually an echo of something that had happened there. For example, you're It is no more a sentient spirit than your reflection in a mirror is you. So so that that's why with a lot of these, you know, um, these paranormal investigators are constantly looking for boogeymen and devils and demons and and all these things. Um, I'm not saying that there may not be some negative energy out there, but you got to be careful before jumping to the conclusion. But when I'm doing um, um, readings for people and I open up my brain to frequency, I will see, hear, feel, smell, touch, taste, sense things and know things. Let me make it easy. I want everybody listening to think of the Statue of Liberty. That's how I see spirits. Okay, that that's that's a form of clairvoyance. In other words, if, if I see an image in my mind's eye, it's like a vivid memory, mm-hmm. okay? But maybe, maybe Debbie, you see the Statue of Liberty looking a little bit more green than I do. Maybe I see her looking a little more aqua. All right, so we're going to have some differences there. That's what's known as subjective clairvoyance. You, because subjective means one person sees it, which is inside your mind's eye. Objective clairvoyance is when one or more people see a spirit external to, to your body. So say there's like four or five of us and all of a sudden you see this, what, you know, a spirit appear in front of us, then that can be objectively verified, ergo objective clairvoyance. When I hear things, it's like hearing a voice in your head. Sometimes it's my voice. Sometimes it isn't. Then I'll smell, um, touch, uh, or, or sense things. I get a lot of physical sensations about how people died. So uh, for me, it's, it's a whole body experience. Uh, the fascinating part is when all of a sudden they give me information that I could not possibly know. Um, Like recently I was doing a reading for this woman and her husband's spirit says to me, igloo. And I'm like, igloo? Now I live in Florida. It's not like igloos are a thing here. And I go, igloo? He's talking about an igloo. And she goes, oh my God. And I said, what? She said, well, I was talking to my daughter on the phone yesterday She's in Alaska right now because she's marrying this nice guy up there. And she called me to tell me about her wedding planner who used to live in an igloo. She goes, do you think that's it? Uh, And then we both started laughing. I was like, well, of course that's it. And here's the thing. Why would I whip out igloo? I mean, seriously, Debbie, when's the last time you had a conversation about an igloo? No. Yeah, exactly. And um, I have another one. I always love this example. Doing a session for this woman and her husband came through and he shows me the image of an octopus. And I'm like, octopus? And she, and I love, this is great for a medium when you hear, oh my God. So every time we hear, oh my God, we know that's good. She said, we used to live in Belize and we lived on this canal and we'd catch lobsters and we'd stick them in this tank overlooking the canal. And one morning, my husband and I came out with our coffee and an octopus was climbing up out of the canal and grabbing one of our lobsters. She said, do you think that's what he's talking about? (laughs) And I said, well, unless you have another octopus story, I'm kind of thinking, yeah. And and, and we were cracking up. Now, octopus? (laughs) I mean, if I would have said puppy, I mean, come on, everybody has a puppy or a kitten story. But how many people have an octopus story? Amazing. So if, you know, if somebody's sitting before you, I'm sitting before you and I'm sure you're turned off, but is it just like you somehow synergistically connect with them and just things start happening? Or 
Is it that the being uh, that is wanting to connect actually speaks up and says, let's do this, help me here, and points you to somebody? Here's the way I, I describe it. Um, a spirit is an electromagnetic soul, an EMS, all right? And, and like I said, in the afterlife frequency, I go into great um, depth explaining that, that theory. And a number of scientists, including Dr. Gary Schwartz from the University of Arizona's Laboratory of Advanced um, Consciousness and Health, um, has adopted the term. And it's, it's, it's quite an honor. And if you're listening, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. But what happens is, think of, we live in AM radio spirits, the afterlife frequency is FM radio. And so during spirit communication, a spirit will adjust his or her or a group of them, their frequency out of a FM. I'm elevating my frequency beyond AM and we get a frequency match. So it's a frequency alignment. And sometimes it's really tight and you start getting the really good details. And sometimes you have, you know, more difficult connections and so some of the information may seem a bit more sporadic or diffuse. And it, in spirit communication, it's a three-way street. So think of a triangle. And the other side, the afterlife frequency is at the top. On the two bottom um, um, points of the triangle is, is the medium, myself, and the client. And so there's a three-way bit of information because the spirit is transmitting information to me. I'm conveying it to the client. And if the client acknowledges it and confirms it, then the spirits keep sending more. But there's a concept that I've introduced called the no, no, no syndrome. Some people, no, no, no. They start shooting everything down or they're overthinking things or they're hyper analyzing or they want it to be perfect and exact and they create an energetic block. And that's when that alignment starts to have problems. Um, like I always tell people, if I'm close to a name, cut me some slack. So recently I'm doing a reading and a woman's mother comes through and I hear Anna. No, no, no. Her name was Hana. Okay. If I oh, hear Anna yeah. and the name is Anna. Seriously. See, no, no, no. She was flooding the energetic field with no, no, no. Or um, the other day I was doing a reading. I said, okay, there's a young male coming through and I'm feeling dizzy disorientation. Um, which something was affecting his mental focus and clarity. It feels like a heavy sedative and I feel cardiopulmonary failure and I'm getting a metallic taste in my um, mouth, which indicates some type of drug. No, he died from a fentanyl overdose. That's well, it. that's exactly what I just described. Yeah. And, and so it's very important. And I'm, and, and I'm not, and I also realize especially at the beginning of a reading, it takes time for, for the recipient to get into the groove and understand where it's going, yeah. but you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention um, because that's exactly what I just described because I'm feeling it. I mean, sometimes they'll come up and they'll hold something up, they'll hold a calendar and point to a date. I love when that happens, but it doesn't always because a lot of people say, well, why don't they just tell you? Well, first off, communicating with spirits isn't Alexa or Google. We are communicating with another dimension. And that dimension, that collective of spirits, is emitting a wave of electromagnetic energy. These electromagnetic souls are sending this vibrational wave, and their energy field then interacts with the electrical field in my brain, and it gets converted into recognizable concepts based on my memories, feelings, and cultural associations. So that means, uh, like the other day, I was doing a reading for this guy, and I said, um, it was his partner who passed. I said, I'm seeing a woodpecker, like Woody Woodpecker. And, and he paused, and he says, oh, my God, we opened up a business, and a woodpecker was the logo to the business. Oh. Bingo. See, yeah. he was getting it. And so, so that's why, you know, if this isn't Alexa, this isn't Google, it is interdimensional communication between our material world dimension and the afterlife frequency dimension. That is so interesting to me. I mean, first of all, I've watched enough of you on television, on these news shows, talk shows, et cetera, where you immediately go into the audience and start working with somebody 
And it is very funny. And I love how I, you have a very subtle way of training them where you'll ask a question. It's very obvious. Somebody named Jeannie. And there's two women. They'll say, huh, we have a sister named Jeannie. And you'll say, that's a yes. <laughs> and so you're starting to show them that's a yes. Go with the yeses so more can come through. Really interesting stuff. And I was also thinking while you were saying that, when you're talking about the vibration, I am into UFOs, I'm into extraterrestrials and all that. And um, I love it, right? And that is very much what they talk about. Because uh, yes. I interview a lot of people who channel extraterrestrials, they're extraordinary beings and definitely benevolent beings of light. And they come in and they say, for us to connect with you, we are such an advanced civilization and some of us are not even embodied. We have to create our frequency to match you or come right. into the channel. So this is something that exists. This frequency exists everywhere. This adaptation in order to connect. And I want to ask you, because I think it's very interesting in your bio, that you like ancient mysteries. Yes. Are there complex history? that with mysteries that you're fascinated about, is there anything that you'd like to share about that mm, you just love to sink your teeth into? Oh, I mean, I was just on uh, Coast to Coast AM on Friday, October 13th to talk about where the um, superstition about Friday the 13th came from. So meaning, and I'm going to make a little Coast to Coast joke, you had to wake up at 2 a.m. to do it? Because that's or you can, uh, you know, um, if you go to their website, it'll show you how you can subscribe and you can hear the uh, uh, the podcast after the fact. But um, they have me on quite a bit to discuss various ancient mysteries. And uh, Friday uh, the 13th is one of them. I've also discussed uh, current theories on the discovery of the Loch Ness Monster. Also, what is the Bermuda Triangle? Discovery of the Gate of Hell. Um, the truth behind 666. So there's been several ancient mysteries. Um, I've spent a good part of my life studying Egyptology and uh, the fascination that I, that I have with, with um, well, pretty much all of ancient Egypt. Um, um, I, I'm a firm belief that um, with the, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, I uh, was actually on Coast to Coast and several programs to discuss the curse of King Tut. Because what's fascinating is after they discovered the tomb, people started dying, and in, in a lot of them in very macabre ways. And I'll tell a quick one. Um, so Howard Carter, he was the archaeologist. Um, I, I like Howard Carter, but he would have been an insufferable personality. He insulted people. He was brilliant. He couldn't stand the media. He hated asking, you know, answering questions. But he's being bankrolled by Lord Carnarvon, the seventh Earl of Carnarvon, who lived in High Clare Castle, which we know better as Downton Abbey. That's where they filmed Downton Abbey. And in fact, his uh, great grandson is like the ninth Earl of Carnarvon, and they're still living there. Um, uh, so, so anyway, Carter finds a tomb, and and. He was a quirky guy, and he lived in a house not too far from the Valley of the Kings, and he bought this canary a couple of weeks before, and the staff at his, his home, the Egyptian staff, they were used to him insulting everybody, like he was always insulting their intelligence and all this, and the canary would sing to him, and it used to calm him down. In fact, the canary became the mascot of the expedition. They called it the, um, the ex excavation, the expedition of the golden bird. And so it was November 4th of 1922, and Carter woke up, and um, he went to, to the dig, and nobody was working. And he was like, why is nobody working? And that meant either somebody got killed or they found something. And the foreman came up and said, we found a step, and they found this step in the sand, and they started uncovering, and they found 16 steps leading down into the earth. 
And every tomb of, of a pharaoh in the Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Kings has nothing to do with the pyramids, okay? The pyramids were already 1,500 to 2,000 years old by the time of, of King Tut. And the unthinkable happened. The door to the tomb had a seal, a clay seal on the door that was intact which meant it had not been opened. And the seal had the cartouche, the royal symbol of a name, Tutankhamun. So now Carter knew he found something. At that precise moment at his house, a few miles away, the staff in his home heard a terrible noise and they ran into the sitting room and a cobra had gotten into the cage and was devouring the canary. And the Egyptian staff was horrified and they were also superstitious. And they realized that a cobra was the symbol of the Egyptian pharaohs. So I'll leave it right there. Whoa, that's amazing. Thank you. Oh my gosh, we have to follow you to see much more of what you do and share. Thank you. That was such a good story. Yes. And I um, tune into Coast to Coast to hear more. Thank you. Thank you. So we're at the end here, Mark. And this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? As much as I'd like to say um, what I would like for myself, I'm just a drop of water in a much larger ocean. And I wish, I dream that human beings could stop the desire to conquer, dominate, and harm each other. That people would actually treat each other the way they want to be treated. And, you know, you can say that that's, you know, airy, fairy, wishful thinking, but. I, I, I dream of that. I also dream that our brain trust on this planet, instead of being focused on developing weapons to destroy each other, that instead we'd work, uh, get all our, like when COVID, when the whole worldwide lockdown, all of a sudden, um, all the scientists were working together to come up with, with treatments and with a vaccine. And I know you know there's anti-vaxxers and all that, but it gave us a glimpse just for a brief period of time that if our brain trust on this planet was put together to cure cancer, to develop stem cell and cellular and energy healing modalities to cure diseases, our brain trust could also be put to use to develop clean energy sources, also to developing more efficient use of food production so that we can stop deforesting the planet and fishing our seas into non-existence. That's what I dream of. Because, yeah, I could say, yeah, I'd like to win the Powerball, and people say, well, why don't you ask the spirits? Well, it's not like I haven't. And the thing is, they may give me numbers, but they don't necessarily tell you when those numbers are going to come out. So they can give me the winning numbers that may come out 11 years, 17 days, and eight hours from now. But the thing is, um, I would rather see a healthier, less violent, and more intelligent human race. That's what I dream of. Mm. I will buy stock in that dream. Thank you for coming on the show. It's afterlifefrequency.com. Any other place where you want to direct people to connect with you? That's the best way, afterlifefrequency.com. You can find out about scheduling a reading with me, about tuning into my show, The Psychic and the Doc, about my books. You can buy them there. And also about subscribing, get your um, online subscription, or you can buy it uh, through Amazon. Uh, of Best Holistic Life magazine, because I do write articles for them every month. I've got some really great articles uh, coming up on uh, on all a variety of topics, including ancient mysteries. So, um, Debbie, I really want to thank you for having me on Dare to Dream. This has been so much fun working with you, and I hope someday I get the honor of coming back. Oh, thank you so much. That's a done deal. We want to see that dream come true. And second dream, we will have you back again. Mark Anthony, everybody, afterlifefrequency.com. 
And I end today's show with this quote from Wendy Kennedy. Think of release in terms of simply letting go. There is nothing that you have to learn. There's nothing that you have to overcome. It is just an old, outdated program that you are hitting the delete key on. <clears throat> Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Please leave a comment and share. If you love what you heard in the podcast, but you want to see us, go to Spotify. Videos are there of the show and also youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment. I read them all. Next week on the show is the amazing Wendy Kennedy. She's an intuitive, an empath, and a channel bringing in galactic wisdom for an earthly life. Thanks for joining us today. Don't just dare to dream. Dare to turn all your dreams into your beautiful reality.